Ladies and gentlemen, welcome wrestling fans worldwide to Knoxville and the Great Smoky Mountains for the Ron Fuller Tennessee Studcast. Six feet nine inches tall, 265 pounds. This historic podcast from one of the most respected and successful wrestlers and promoters will follow the footsteps of the largest and oldest wrestling family on the planet. Listen to what I'm saying. That's right. Bring that camera in here a little bit closer. Through 93 years and four Four generations. The stud has arrived. Old school or new fan, this unique broadcast will educate and captivate as Ron details decades of professional wrestling's growth with truly unforgettable stories. I want those people out there at home to hear the stud. Sit back and enjoy the ride with the Tennessee stud. The Tennessee stud. You will learn that name, you will remember it. And now, the stud is here. Hey everybody, welcome in, it's David Summers, this is it, it's another stud cast with the Tennessee stud, Ron Fuller. It's the story of wrestling in America, as told by the stud, whose family started the profession 100 years ago. Now, let's step back into the ring, back into time, we get wall to wall and tree top tall, the Tennessee stud. Ron Fuller in the Great Smoky Mountains of Tennessee. Ron, what's going on, man? Oh man, looking out, looking out at the snow, my man. Got a little snow, and uh, about three or four inches. I guess up in the uh, higher elevations, that's probably double that, probably eight eight inches a foot, maybe. Wow. So uh, it's looking like Tennessee, man, in the winter now. I was checking our radar a while ago. There was some snow to the west of Southeast Alabama, which is where we are. And there was some snow down on the Gulf Coast around the Pensacola area, which you're very familiar with. Looked like it came through fairly quickly, but it was definitely snow to the west of us. But at this point, we're going to get rain and really cold conditions over the next little while, but no snow for southeast Alabama. So so what do you do about the snow? Do you have to take the garbage out? Oh, geez, man. Uh, you just go ahead and do what you got to do, man. <laughs> You know, just, uh, just, uh, you know, not, uh, not too much driving on the road. Right. Right. Obviously that's about the most, uh, intricate part of, uh, dealing with the snow, especially for us old Southern boys. Mm -hmm. So, um, don't like to do a lot of driving in it, but I can walk the trash to the route. Yeah. And when you do walk the trash to the curb, you pretty much just stay right to the point, right? There's not really just like mall walking. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right, Stud, let's keep it locked inside and sit near the fire today. Your Studcast, Ron, is getting more popular every week from the beginning. It's always been one of the most unique wrestling podcasts on the planet, and it's steadily, for like almost six years now, continued to grow in popularity. You're reaching rare air, if I may call it that. And listen, the few weekly podcasts... I can't think of any podcast of any kind that would reach six plus years. You've done that, and that is quite commendable. Well, man, I've, I've kind of always been blessed with some success, Dave, but I thought I'd I'd be uh, only doing these for maybe about a few months when I started it, and uh, it's hard to believe it's been more than six years. So the format's kind of changed slightly over time, but I'm still talking about mostly my wrestling career and the basic wrestling business itself. And luckily, I had the opportunity to experience all that from top to bottom, so I know a little bit about what I'm talking about. So the fact is, you know, it's kind of focused on uh, on old-school wrestling, and uh, that's fine with me. I don't have any interest with what the sport is today anyway. So uh, luckily, my listeners seem to feel the same way, you know, about it. And I, I have to admit, since I started focusing on the weekly cards, the TV's promoting them, the results of the matches, and what was happening around me at that particular time. I'm very much enjoying, man, reliving each each of these weeks, kind of as if it's uh, one of the great chapters of my life, so to speak. Uh, that sounds a little odd, but uh, that's kind of the way I feel about it. Obviously, you're not the only one enjoying these each week. And I remember when you and I first started talking about these, I was like, you know, if you don't put these things down, they're never going to be, they're never going to be history. So you're making them history every week. 
all of these stories, all of the events that took place through time in your amazing career. These studcasts are normally, by the way, they're normally about an hour each, but the last two, I've noticed this, have been closer to 70 minutes, closer to 70 than 60. I don't think that bothers anybody in your fan base because you're really loading up with a ton of information. All right, we're about to ride into another one. So where does the trail take us today? Well, in the last two weeks, I kind of received the greatest response uh, to my uh, to my new hidden history lessons, man. I've started doing something different here, a little change in the format, and it's kind of enabled me to do something I've always wanted to do since the early studcast. I've always wanted to kind of open that kayfabe door that was always closed to fans and, uh, and uh, definitely back in the day, and uh, to not just talk about what was hidden, but maybe even teach. Uh, these older fans and uh, and also the new ones that are listening, how and why things were done as they were back in my grandfather's day and uh, obviously in my father's day as well. So uh, we're going to do just that today, Dave. Uh, in our hidden history lesson, we're going to become bookers and uh, focus on what was happening with a few of the wrestlers that were in the southeastern Gulf Coast territory in the early part of 1980. Uh why some of them were unhappy and how we handled those problems to do what was necessary to keep the momentum going and keep the territory moving, obviously, in the right direction. So um, looking forward to it. Uh, and we may even go right back in history some, maybe uh, exactly 44 years uh, to the weekly card for Southeastern. Uh, this is the card that was going to be in Montgomery, Alabama, Dothan, and specifically Mobile, Alabama, mm. on Tuesday night, January 15, 1980. I'm going to break down another pretty much compelling TV show. This one is really, uh, wow, it's a great one. And to promote that card, uh, that card in all three of those cities, uh, to give the results of the card and the attendances in those three cities. And hopefully after that, we may have some time for a learning tree question again. All right, cool deal. All right, I, but I had no idea there was any problem in the crew in the early part of 1980. We ended the last studcast talking about how good the attendances were in the three major southeastern cities that you mentioned compared to other much larger cities in the country even. So I can't wait to hear was uh, who was unhappy. Well, I guess, Dave, uh, we're going to get to that. But first, I kind of want to ride back north to the original Southeastern Territory in Knoxville, Tennessee. And I kind of want to revisit that territory from time to time for all of those Studcast fans from that part of the country up there that may not be aware of how the new uh, owners were doing, you know, uh, back in the day, plus the old all-star group from Knoxville, the Knoxville Five, uh, uh, kind of want to talk about what they've been doing in the last few months after I left. So. We're going to do a little update, basically, on the, the old Southeastern Territory. So the Georgia promoters, basically, had brought, brought Southeastern uh, some of the biggest names in the sport. Between the middle of October, immediately after their purchase, until the same week that we're going to be discussing later in this studcast. And uh, that's basically because of Jim Barnett's uh, uh, notoriety and his pull, man. He had, he had some great contacts. So we're going to begin today with that week for both territories. And in, in, uh, in Tennessee, we're going to talk about their card, which was on January 13th, 1980. The matches there were presented in the Knoxville Coliseum. It was on a Sunday afternoon. And that was something I had started doing in the winter months in 1975. So I was the first one to ever run in the Coliseum and uh, certainly the first one to ever run Sunday afternoons in the winter. So I'm going to also add the Coliseum attendance uh, into this discussion. So I want to talk to people uh, out there listening about what the Knoxville card was for Sunday afternoon, January 13th, 1980. Uh, I had nothing to do with it. This is by Jim Barnett and, uh, and uh, uh, Fred Ward out of Columbus, Georgia. Those were the guys who were owning that territory at that point. The opening match was Big Bill Dromo versus Buzz Sawyer. Then Bob Jaggers was against Carl Fergie, the Angel, Frank Morrell, Russell Jerry Roberts, Dick Slater, and Terry Funk were on the card against the Sheik and Killer Carl Cox, 
And the main event for the, was for the Southeastern Tag Belts. That was Paul Orndorff and Bob Armstrong versus the champions, David Schultz and Dennis Condry. So, um, you know, and I'm kind of going to break this card down, man, with my opinion of, of uh, who was on it that helped the card and who was on it that really didn't mean anything to this card. Mm. So the guys that did nothing to help make this a great card were all pretty much unknown in that part of the country. It wasn't their fault. They had been there, uh, you know, and uh, Barnett and them had not used a whole lot of them on TV. They hadn't that. So uh, the, I'm talking about Bill Dromo, uh, Buzz Sawyer, uh, Bob Jaggers, Carl Fergie, uh, the Angel, uh, who had been there a few uh, just a little while with me before I sold out to him, mm-hmm. Jerry Roberts, Killer Carl Cox, and the Sheik. So about eight of the 14 guys on this card that they had meant ex- absolutely nothing to these Tennessee fans. They didn't know these guys from Adam's house cap, you know. <laughs> so, uh, you know, Killer Carl Cox and the Sheik were both big names around the country, but pretty much unknown to the Tennessee fans. And the rest of the card now, these are the guys that really helped this card. Obviously, Dick Slater had been there a while. Terry Funk was a huge card in Knoxville. Uh, Paul Orndorff, Bob Armstrong, huge card there. Mm-hmm. David Schultz and Dennis Condry. Uh, those were the names that mattered on this card. And, uh, and all of them had been there many times and, uh, and were over. All those guys were over there. So, you know, I had kind of recommended the Georgia promoters uh, keep more talent when I sold it out, sold out to them. And they, they must not have realized the importance of keeping wrestlers that were very well known by the local fans. And, uh, wow, if you don't know the guys, you're not going to buy a ticket to go see them until you do, until you get, you know, invested in those guys. So it uh, must have affected the house dramatically. The attendance for this crowd, uh, and I spoke to uh, Les Thatcher. I've been talking to Les Thatcher some about it because he's still there at the, during this time frame. He said the crowd on that Sunday was about, Half, half the building, 2,500. So, you know, basically from 1977 all the way through 1979, during the winter when we ran on these Sunday afternoons, uh, if I only had Terry Funk himself on the card, if I added him to a regular card, we would have sold out with 5,000 plus in attendance. Mm. So the new company had been there for almost four months. They were still struggling to, basically to find a way to get their business off the ground. So you know, while I'm here, I might as well talk a little bit about the all-star group. They were certainly doing uh, no better in their small little building. They were running. They had changed buildings about four times already at this point. They were in a very small building by this point. They had lost the great Malenko, Larry Simon, uh, from the original five wrestlers that started that company. He had already gone back to Tampa to live. And, uh, and I'll try to do these updates as often as I can uh, uh, in the future here to keep kind of the Studcast fans in that part of the country up there around Knoxville up to date about uh, what was going on. Yeah, that's an interesting segment on things in Tennessee, in the Tennessee Territory specifically. I had kind of already mentally moved into southeastern Gulf Coast, so that that is a terrific reminder of what was happening up north. So are we ready to jump into today's hidden history lesson about what was going on behind the scenes with the crew in southeastern Gulf Coast? Yes, sir. I mean, uh, we've kind of come back to Knoxville, and I'd like to do that. I'm not going to do it every time, but I'm going to do it every once in a while. Uh, so here we are. Rob and I, we were working together on the book in uh, late December of 1979, and uh, we'd started to pick up uh, – some bad signs from a couple of the wrestlers in the crew. In spite of the territory being on fire, I mean, we were doing tremendous business, as big as anybody in the country. And a good booker, you know, always looked for these type of things, especially when business was down. But a great booker watched for out for a man, uh, even when things were very good. So we had, we had a, seen a couple of guys we felt a little bit uncomfortable with. So it made sense for there to be a, a few bad attitudes uh, when the money wasn't good each week in a territory. That wasn't uncommon. A lot of guys had a little bit of a bad attitude. They weren't making any money. But as a booker, if you didn't care 
uh, care about it to right then about this bad attitudes that were popping up, you were basically doomed. Bad attitudes, man, led, they led directly to bad payoffs. And that led, uh, you know, to the best talent in your crew, maybe giving you a notice that they're leaving and they're moving out of the territory. And eventually you lost enough of those top guys. You're going to lose a job. You're going you're <laughs> to be out of a job. Mm-hmm. All right. So did, as the manager, as the owner, what do you look for? What do you see? What do you notice with somebody who has a bad attitude? Well, it kind of starts in the dressing room. And, uh, and the great bookers, you know, want to have a happy dressing room every night in every city. Uh, they want to see every wrestler kind of engaging with other wrestlers. They want to have a dressing room full of laughter and guys pulling ribs on each other and, mm-hmm. you know, an upbeat, upbeat uh, area. Man. Fun and place to work. A great, everybody's having a good time. Yes, wow, that's yes. what you want, right? So the first thing you look for was a wrestler that was looking for a private dressing room. You know, if a guy's, you know, if you got the big dressing rooms and then you got these a lot bigger buildings where they have these smaller dressing rooms, and then you got these guys that want to go into a dressing room by themselves. And uh, when I saw that, it always said to me that they didn't want to be part of the team. You know, I mean, they don't want to be involved in all that stuff out there. And uh, so a territory and fire was basically a, a winning team, like a football team, man. If you're winning, you know, you're having – everybody's upbeat and everything is going great. And a dead territory was usually a losing team, you know. And basically a wrestling crew is a team, you know. If they're not working together and they're not happy, uh, you're not going to have success. So I noticed that Archie Goldie, the Mongolian stomper's son, was often looking for a dressing room by himself. You didn't see him in there with everybody else. And also Frankie Kane, the great Mephisto. So uh, Stomper's son, you know, he, he had he had a couple of really uh, things that back that, that took away from what he was doing. He was not a very good worker, and uh, and he was being carried in most of his matches by his father, who was also tag champion with him along with being the southeastern champion so uh stomper stomper's son was kind of young and that probably since this was his first territory that he'd ever worked in i think he was so young he was maybe missing home so his being unhappy you know when payoffs were good that wasn't a very good sign for darn sure now frankie kane the great mephisto the his was a totally different situation he was always kind of a loner, uh, never one of those guys that was having a good time. Uh, but both Rob and I got the feeling he wasn't happy when we started uh, making him wrestle some. When he came in, he was just a manager. Now he's starting to have to wrestle some. So he, um, besides managing both the Stomper uh, as, a, as a single and then uh, the Stomper and his son as the tag team champions, uh, you know, but we made sure that he got paid extra to wrestle. You know, we wanted him to be happy. Obviously, you wanted all your crew to be happy. Mm-hmm. How did so? How did you fix it? Well, you first. I mean, always you had to go if you had a you thought you had a problem with somebody. You wanted to have a private conversation with that person to find out if there's a problem, what the problem was, if possible. You know, and so and if it could be fixed. You saw a difference in the, in their attitude, you know. If you if you heard their problem and you and you worked on it, and the, then you and their attitude improved, then you moved forward with them. You kept them, and if not, you started to look for somebody else. So in both of these cases that I just mentioned, uh, Stomper's son and uh, and uh, Great Mephisto, uh, after the private conversations, it was obvious that uh, I wasn't going to be able to make them happy. You know, and, and I had dealt with that, obviously, in 1979. I dealt with, with five wrestlers in particular, man, and then I had a war. So uh, this was, I was determined to never experience that again. You know, if I got somebody, if I got one guy that's unhappy, I'm going to move that guy right now, you know. And uh, so that uh, may uh, save a whole territory. So we were going to be losing two heels. And uh, we only needed to replace those two heels. And if we got the right guys, uh, we were going to be in good shape. 
So, uh, so you remember, Dave, two stud casts ago, I believe it was, I brought uh, up to Jim Barnett a way for him to maybe crush the all-star group that he was competing with. I suggested uh, that he offer them, you know, that he offer their two top baby faces, which mm-hmm. was Ronnie Garvin and Ron Wright, uh, a job. And that they that he uh, that they, they accepted uh, that would maybe kill his Knoxville competition completely. Hmm. I do I do remember that specifically. You had suggested he give Ronnie Garvin and Ron Wright a guaranteed amount of money every week to wrestle for him, to take them away from the other company, and also to benefit him in the Georgia ter- territory. That's correct. That's it. So we still had some competition in the Gulf Coast. We still had a little group down there running matches about three days a week. And I think it was called Tri-State Wrestling was the name of this little company. And they had two heels that had both worked for me in Knoxville and in the Gulf Coast Territory. Those two heels was Don Carson and Don Fargo. So our situation was very different. I wasn't worried about the other company ever becoming a real threat like things happened in Knoxville. Uh, Both these guys were a great fit for our territory. And uh, so Don Carson was the perfect guy to replace Frankie Kane, the great Mephisto. Uh, Carson had managed the Mongolian Stomper in Knoxville for more than a year. He'd also wrestled every night as well during that time frame. And there had never had a complaint about it. Uh, Mephisto wanted to complain about it a little bit. So uh, just as important as uh, Don Carson was the best wrestler, man, to keep a dressing room upbeat and to keep a whole wrestling crew happy that I'd ever seen. I mean, Carson was amazing. God just loved him. And uh, Don Fargo had been in and out of the Gulf Coast Territory basically since the 1960s. And it always been there around the main event, always up toward the top of the card. And he was also one of those guys that contributed greatly to that extremely important man, uh, contented dressing room that was just absolutely necessary to do good business. Okay. So, I, I mean, I feel like you're making us part of the business itself. Talking to us like we were one of the boys in the dressing room. I think that's really cool. These wrestling lessons are always interesting. So how soon were Mephisto and the Stomper's son, how soon before they were going to be leaving? Well, well, they had both uh, been given a two-week notice, basically, after this uh, first conversation, and, and, and it looked like there wasn't going to be a way to make them happy. And as uh, soon, and uh, we were going to replace them, basically, as soon as we could uh, get Carson and Fargo uh, in there and, uh, and ready to take their spots. So really no wasting of any time. So how was that? Uh, how was it? Uh, how was that done in, in every? T- is it done like like that in every tori- territory? I guess is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, well, you know, there, it was always a little bit different. Uh, just just as all bookers were different, uh, you know, everybody handled their business differently in the sport. Uh, Stomper's son, he was eager to go. <laughs> he didn't have a problem at all. Frankie Kane had already made a deal with somebody else and was about to give us a notice. Wow. So, you know, uh, so if we hadn't made the move and uh, found out about this, uh, because if, if we waited and, and in Frankie's case, uh, uh, he would, we needed to have uh, Frankie lose some matches. He's got a belt, right? We needed, mm-hmm. we don't, we need to get him into a position where we can utilize the fact that he's over pretty good. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. you know, so, uh, that's basically what we had to do, and we had to get to work on it right away uh, to get it all fixed. Okay, gotcha. All right, but before we take our break, can you give us the January 15th, 1980 card in the Southeastern Gulf Coast Territory that we're going to be talking about coming up next? And I'd be glad to. I, I got to admit, man, this is another great card. I mean, uh, Terry Orndorff, who's Hall of Fame brother, Paul Orndorff, uh, that I mentioned earlier, it, uh, we was still up there in uh, in uh, Tennessee. Uh, Terry was going to be wrestling Norvell Austin. Uh, Eddie Boulder was going to be taking on Jimmy Golden. Tony Charles was uh, back again, man, uh, to get another shot at regaining his United States Junior Heavyweight Championship belt uh, from the great Mephisto. Uh, in a loser must unmask match, the wrestling pro, Leon Baxter, was facing the super pro. 
And in a Southeastern Tag Championship match, Rob and I were getting our first shot at the champions, the Mongolians, managed by the great Mephisto. The winners were going to receive the belts, and the loser of the fall in that match was going to have to leave Southeastern. And then in the main event, for the second time, these two guys were going to meet. Joe LaDuke was getting his first shot at winning the Southeastern Championship from the Mongolian Stomper, managed by the great Mephisto. Good deal. Okay, so another fantastic card. After the break, we're going to do that now and get that out of the way. After the break, we're going to find out what's on the TV that promoted this three championship matches card, one with the loser leaving, and who would be losing their mask. That's coming up when this Studcast continues in a moment. Okay, Studcast fans, it is time for another Ask the Stud question and answer show. This time, it's number 13 with more tremendous questions from some of the best wrestling fans anywhere in the world. This one will be released Saturday, January 20th of 2024. These one hour plus unique wrestling history lessons can only be found on YouTube Southeastern Rewind with answers coming from one of the most knowledgeable people in the history of the sport. Ron Fuller, the Tennessee stud. Get ready for something special. It only happens once a month. Ask the Stud number 13 is being recorded for you right now. Don't miss it. YouTube, Southeastern Rewind. All right, Studcast fans, welcome back. Another Studcast with the Tennessee Stud, Ron Fuller. I'm David Summers as the stories continue. Okay, Ron, what can you tell us about the TV show that promoted the great card you described right before the break? Let's get into it. Well, it opened with the wrestling pro, Leon Baxter sitting at the set with Charlie. And uh, Leon was very upset about what had happened to him days earlier and his long-awaited chance to become the United States Junior Heavyweight Champion in his match against the great Mephisto. And he told Charlie he thought he was through with this so-called super pro last week. He thought that that was all settled and that guy was out of his hair. And uh, then he, he, and he had no plans to ever wrestle him again and he says, uh, let's watch this video, Charlie, and let's so fans can see exactly why he's not out of my hair, man. I've still got, I've still got uh, something to deal with here. So it showed the wrestling pro had a sleeper hold on the great Mephisto. This is in his match for the, the United States Junior Heavyweight Championship. And the pro told Charlie, you know, nobody uh, had ever escaped his, his sleeper hold. And at that moment, he uh, he was basically the new United States junior heavyweight champion. Uh, Mephisto was going down toward the mat. The pro had him wrapped uh, wrapped all around his neck with his sleeper hold. And uh, then into the ring came the super pro. And he stomped the pro in the back until uh, he released the hold. And then the referee had no choice but uh, he ring the bell and disqualify Mephisto. Well, obviously, that meant the pro couldn't win the belt. The pro had the belt won. He had a big, he had a point there. You know, he had, Mephisto wasn't going to get out of it. He was going to win the championship. Here comes the super pro and uh, does it to him again. So the pro explained that his victory slipped away in that instant. And it wasn't ever going to happen again. He told, uh, you know, Charlie said, uh, I talked to Don Curtis, the Southeastern commissioner, and uh, I made sure he's seen this video. And uh, he agreed with me that it was time to end all this. That next week, uh, he, he, he was going to be wrestling the so-called Super Pro one last time. And the loser of that match was going to have to take his mask off so that everybody could see his face in the middle of the ring when he lost. Uh, Pro said, uh, you know, he'd been wearing a mask for more than 20 years. And he had never lost the match in which his mask was at stake. And that after this mass versus mass match next week, that uh, there was only going to be one pro here again, like it used to be. And, uh, and all the fans were going to be able to see for themselves what this imposter, this uh, so-called <laughs> super pro looks like and find out who he really is. So it really sounds like finally this long running feud was about to be over. So who was in the first TV match? Well, it was a so-called super pro. Mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. He was immediately focused on 
You know, as soon as he got in the ring, he sees the pro sitting over there with Charlie, and he started talking trash to him. Uh, you know, <laughs> while he's beating up his opponent, he just going to the rope and keep continuing to scream shit uh, that stuff to the pro. So this masked man, you know, was looking stronger every week. Uh, he wasn't getting weaker. He was looking better. I can tell you one thing. As a kid, from, from a kid all the way up to an adult, I saw so many wrestlers trying to take the mask off the wrestling pro. I never saw his face one time. I'm talking many years, and nobody had ever done it. So I can't wait to hear what happens in this upcoming match. And who was on the second TV match? Uh, well, Rob and I were, but before we went to the ring, we went to the set with Charlie. So we watched the video of our win from the week before. We wrestled against Jimmy Golden and Norvell Austin. It was for that $10,000 prize from the Battle Royal from two weeks earlier. And uh, so we had won that match. We got a huge hand from the studio audience. And uh, so we were in the next TV match. Uh, well, but we had, uh, you know, and Charlie, uh, they, 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 they gave us $10,000 in $100 bills, basically. Uh, big handful for me, big handful for Rob. And we're going to the ring to wrestle. So we said, uh, Charlie said, Charlie, we, we can't take this to the ring. Can you hang on to it for us? And Charlie said, well, of course I can. Ed, give him the money. Right? And yeah. he stuffed the cash in his pocket. So, you know, so we got a huge hand from the studio audience uh, when we went into the ring. But, you know, uh, having no place to, the, we left it with Charlie. Uh, Charlie's handling the cash and the, so uh, then we went to the ring to take care of business. So uh, we got a, you know, we were uh, busy in the ring. And uh, so Jimmy Golden and Norville Austin, they kind of paid an unscheduled visit to Charlie at the set. Uh, they started out complaining about how we stole the Battle Royal money from them. Mm. And, we, and, uh, and, and they weren't getting any sympathy from Charlie because he knew that wasn't the case. So he reminded them, you know, he said, only thing I remember about the battle royal is the, how you two guys injured Ron and Robert Fuller's daddy, the father, right? Uh, and he, so he reminded them about that. And, uh, and so then they kind of got in his face and, uh, you know, uh, they said, uh, we, we happen to know uh, that uh, we just watched you put $10,000 in your pockets, Charlie Platt. And uh, so Rob and I are up in the ring, we're wrestling, but we're kind of keeping an eye on what's going on out here with Golden and Austin. And then all of a sudden, they start physically trying to take the money off of Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> so we just left the ring, man. You know, and we went after the would-be thieves, man. <laughs> Wait a minute, this ain't going to happen. And uh, so the studio crowd got more than just the fight. You know, for our money, uh, <laughs> that they had to, you know, that they, they, they had kind of lost interest in the TV match. They were watching us get to Golden and, and Austin, man. And uh, <laughs> soon they took off to the head dressing room, empty handed, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, but they had more heat than they ever had. All right. So <laughs> were they going to actually take the money from Charlie? First of all, I believe Charlie said, yeah, I'll hold the money for you. I believe that part. Definitely. All right. Yeah. But, <laughs> yeah. But could, could they have ended up in jail? I, I mean, don't know, man. I mean, the, if they had taken the money, you know, I mean, <laughs> the police probably would have had to come and get them. You know, I mean, they would have had to say, wait, wait uh, we, uh, everybody witnessed the crime, right? So, yeah. Yeah. So it wouldn't have been the first crime for Jimmy, basically. Because uh, remember, I think I told a, a story a, a couple of stud casts ago about, uh, Having Jimmy having to come and live with us, and uh, when we were when he was in high school, mm -hmm. because he got in trouble with the law, mm -hmm. and, and then then he had, had then he added to you know uh, how bad it was having to be a slave driver. I think he told the story about our dad being a slave driver and forced him to do work like a dog every day, and that's the reason you know he said he turned on my dad. In the summer of 1979, you know, he, mm. I waited for years, I think he said, <laughs> to get even, right? Wow. I remember that story very well. Jimmy had definitely become a character of suspect. All right, so how about the personality profile on this TV show? Well, this one was all about the great Mephisto, man, and his Mongolian tag team champions, 
Uh, he had the Southeastern champion. He had the television champion was the Mongolian stopper. He had, uh, you know, it was a, and it was pre-recorded uh, before the audience ever was brought into the studio. That's something that Mephisto had kind of insisted upon. And, uh, you know, it was done in a different part of the studio than normal. Uh, they had four championship belts between the three of them. Uh, and they had a huge TV trophy, and it probably looked like, I'd say, where this uh, little set that uh, they pre- that uh, Mephisto designed, basically, in the studio, it probably looked like his bedroom, where he was keeping all these precious prizes, man, at home. So, uh, you know, Char- Charlie, only Charlie and Mephisto were seated in this. Uh, the two Mongols were standing behind them, and in front of them was all the treasure, man, you know, and... Mephisto, he had on one of his finest Arab robes and his headgear. And uh, after being informed last week that he and his men were going to be on the next week's profile, he had obviously put a lot of thought into how he wanted to do this profile. So, uh, you know, his peacock pride, I guess that's a good way of putting it, peacock pride, mm-hmm. and it couldn't be hidden, <laughs> is, uh, you know, was the Mongolian standing behind him. You know, they were just... Wow, all beaming with smiles. It was great. It was the top of their game. So he instantly took control of the profile. He welcomed Charlie to their set. <laughs> he started off, so, here, Charlie, uh, sit down. I welcome you here, man. This is my set. <laughs> so, so then he launched into what he had predicted. On the day, he said, Charlie, I'm going to take you back to the day I got here. And we all arrived here a month earlier, months earlier. And he goes, uh, to this godforsaken part of the world, you know, I mean, he, he, you know, he, so he was, you know, he, he couldn't say enough bad things, man. So, uh, and then he said, uh, you know, and you can remember how we uh, t- took control now of all the trophies, all the belts, and we've got control of all the wrestlers here too, really. He says, and we you know we proved, proven our superiority in, uh, to my homeland people, and, uh, and as well as to these ignorant people in this part of the country. And, and uh, you know, and obviously the Mongols have made their homeland very proud of, for what they've done since we've been here. So he said it was quickly, you know, it became quickly, obviously, obvious that Charlie uh, was not expected uh, this kind of personality profile. <laughs> he had never done one of these. It was set up in a different place. Uh, you know, he didn't really... They know what to do. So he tried to take a little control of what was happening because it was apparent. And, you know, it was not the, the great Mephisto's. He wasn't in the plans of Mephisto to go anywhere but to where Mephisto wanted to go. So Mephisto began to name off the wrestlers that his men and he himself had dethroned to become champions here, including those that he said had permanently been eliminated from competition here by beating them in loser league matches. He said, the infidels I'm talking about, Charlie, is Kevin Sullivan, Jerry Stubbs, and Bob Armstrong. So Charlie saw an opening to get involved, you know, so he quickly brought up this upcoming Southeastern Tag Championship match between me and Rob getting our first shots at the championship belt and the loser of the fall was going to have to leave Southeastern. And he told Mephisto, he said, uh, you know, this could mean the end of your team's dominance of that championship, the, the Southeastern championships. So Mephisto, he didn't like it. He got mad, you know, and he, he didn't hesitate. He jumped right on Charlie. He says, you know, you Americans are so confident. He goes, you, y'all, y'all are the best at everything. That's what you think. And he, and he says, you take – Take for granted, victory is always yours. And he goes, uh, and that's precisely why y'all are such losers. <laughs> that is, that in this upcoming Southeastern tag match, all things going to happen is another infidel is going to be leaving here, just like the three I mentioned uh, earlier. So studio audience, uh, they let them know what they thought, even though this was pre-recorded, right? They booed like crazy. Mephisto and them weren't even out there. They're watching this on the TV, but they were still gotten, they got mad at Mephisto. He had some heat. So uh, Mephisto and the Mongols, you know, they were in a dressing room and they hear this reaction from the crowd and they come out uh, into the studio. 
And, uh, you know, and they look over there at the bleachers and the fans where everybody was sitting in Mephisto looks at the stomper. And you know what the stomper was all about when it came to coming out in the studio. And uh, Mephisto looks over at the bleachers and he points to the stomper and he goes, basically, go get him. So, boy, as usual, <laughs> all hell broke. Loose. And, you know, the, the profile's practically not... It's it's in the vast very last seconds of it, mm -hmm. and, and now you got the stomper over there, and everybody is just running like crazy again. And uh, and uh, this was maybe one of the worst ones ever. So Charlie was back, you know, back on the set, and he was screaming. He was still on the set, and he's screaming at Mephisto to get him, get him, guys. You know, we did, you know it wasn't something we wanted to see. Wow, so I'm mean, pretty dangerous for the fans, wasn't it? I mean, it was very dangerous. I mean, people are jumping off the bleachers and running <laughs> into each other. And, uh, you know, uh, you, you you could have lawsuits and people could get hurt bad. So yeah. I think it was Mephisto's idea at this point, you know, because uh, we had to do, you know, we had this conversation with him about a week ago, mm -hmm. found out that we weren't going to be able to keep him. He'd already made a, made a deal with somebody else to begin with. Then, you know, so, uh, and he knew he wasn't ever going to return to Southeastern after this. So, uh, you know, we kind of thought Rob and I later when we talked about it, this, I think this guy did this on purpose. You know, he wow. was such a, he was, he was more than a, than a heel just for TV fans. He was pretty oh. much a heel period. So he kind of made it blow up a little bigger than what you guys expected. It seems like so. All right. After things settled down, who was in the next TV match? Well, the former United States Junior Heavyweight Champion, Tony Charles. And uh, he had another chance to win his belt back. And uh, he let everybody in the building know how important this upcoming match to him was with Mephisto. And uh, wow, when he got in the ring, I mean, he hit his opponent with more throws in one match than I had ever seen him do. Wow, he had this guy flying. And uh, <laughs> it didn't last very long, but... It was amazing. Uh, you know, I saw him do a couple of them that I had never seen him do before. Wow. All right. So who was in the last match on this TV show? Well, it opened up with Joe LaDuke at the set with Charlie. And uh, they watched uh, the extremely bloody first mobile match between him, so LaDuke, and the Mongolian stopper. And uh, these matches were hard to watch, man, unless you were a hardcore type of wrestling fan. These matches between LeDuc and Stomper were, oh, they were violent. And uh, Joe made his point about all the horrible things that had happened between him and the Mongol, including the blockbuster video that we showed uh, the TV before. And uh, now he was focused uh, on winning the Southeastern Championship. He was going to get his first shot at the title. He finished by asking Charlie who was in the last TV match. Well, that was going to be my, my next question. Why did he ask that, though? reason for it uh, you know because uh you know when charlie told him uh, it was the mongolian stomper who was going to be in that match mm -hmm. he had seen what the stomper just pulled with all the people on the bleachers and they had finally come back in the studio basically so uh mm. he got up he said thank you very much charlie and he went straight over to the bleachers and he sat down right in the middle of all the fans <laughs> in the bleachers because the stomper was going to be the next guy to wrestle mm-hmm so, All right. So did he? <laughs> you know, he, he expected them to charge him. And Stomper, Stomper, I think Stomper would have gone straight there. But Stomper, as soon as he came out of the dressing room with Mephisto, uh -huh. his opponent was already in the ring. So was the announcer. So Stomper just charged up in the ring uh, before he even saw Joe LaDuke sitting over in the bleachers. <laughs> he just went straight after the guy that he was going to wrestle. And the announcer, he ba he beat it. He, he just, as soon as he saw the Stomper come roaring into the ring, he jumped out. He didn't even announce the match. <laughs> and Stomper grabbed this young guy, and, I mean, he pounded him, and he jerked him up, threw him in the ropes, kicked him in the stomach, and began just stomping him in the face. It was like, wow. He was, Stomper was really, really making a scene that day. Uh, and I don't know how much uh, Mephisto, how much Mephisto had control of all that or not, but uh, 
Stomper was really pretty outrageous. And they, so he turned, uh, at this point, after he stomped this kid in the face a few times, the guy's bleeding, and, uh, and he turned in to the studio audience. And he jumped out of the ring, and they started to charge into the audience. But when he did, here came the big lumberjack. I mean, and Joe LaDuke got right in his face. <laughs> and I mean, wow, the war was on. I mean, God almighty, they tore into each other. They fought up into the ring. They fought through the ring, out the far side of the ring. They fought over to where Charlie's set was. And uh, the bell was ringing, uh, and, you know, but they didn't pay any attention to the bell or anything else. Once those guys got into it, there was no stopping them. And uh, so uh, then Joe grabbed the stomper by the back of the head, and he slammed his face into Charlie's desk. And uh, <laughs> so me and the guys in the dressing room are watching this, and I'm going, oh, boy, we this, is, this ain't good, you know. Uh, so I said, we got to stop this. So uh, the guys went with me. We left the dressing room. We went out, and we tried to stop it. So it was the first time, basically, that the TV audience at home had any opportunity to see the real violence between these two guys, man, and and how much they hated each other. So, uh, you know, wrestlers then from the other dressing room, they came out to help us pull them apart. We had to pull them apart. Uh, It was like pandemonium in the building, man. It was the wildest (laughs) studio fight I think I'd ever seen. (laughs) Pandemonium. I love when you say that word. All right, so I wish I'd been there to see that in person. I don't remember ever seeing anything quite like that. That's a really good TV show. All right, so who won the matches that week? Well, the fight was uh, just a small sample of what was happening, man, in the arenas each week. And so uh, these two went at it with reckless abandon it whenever they got locked up. And uh, so Norvell Austin, he got a win over uh, Terry Orndorff. Uh, Jimmy Golden beat Eddie Boulder. Uh, Tony Charles regained his United States heavyweight championship belt from the great Mephisto. But he didn't leave the ring with it. Uh, After his win, uh, Tony was trying to put the belt on, and it was pretty hard to buckle those belts behind your back uh, with your own hands. And the referee kind of came to help him. Tony wanted to buckle his belt on to make a point to Mephisto, I think, today. This is my belt has been always, and you'll never touch it again. And uh, so uh, when the referee's trying to help Tony, uh, Mephisto attacked Charles from behind, and he put him in his camel clutch, and uh, then he left the ring, took Tony's belt. So in the mask versus mask, the loser man, loser has to unmask uh, that match. The wrestling pro put the super pro to sleep again, you know, and uh, <laughs> and then – When he got his hand raised, then before he woke him up, you know, just to make sure that he was going to get his mask pulled off, he pulled his mask off while he's asleep. And uh, and he set him up on his rear end and he braced him up against his knee so all the fans could see his face. And uh, then uh, so the pro smacked him on the back. He woke him up and he got right out of the ring and left. And uh, so his name, uh, you know, uh, who was being announced, uh, the, this, this super pro, super pro's name was being announced to the crowd by the announcer, you know? And, uh, so the former super pro realized he'd already been unmasked <laughs> it, 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 while he was asleep. So boy, he got, he really blew up. It's like, what in the heck, man? He took my mask off. You know, that ain't right. So he grabbed his mask. It was laying on the ring beside him. And then he grabbed the microphone away from the announcer who was in the ring. And he screamed on the microphone, you, you haven't seen the end of me yet, pro. He goes, you know, you so-called pro. He goes, and then he, and he headed back to his dressing room. Wow. But w- wait a second, Stud. Do you mean this wasn't over between the two of them? Well, to be honest, I mean, you know, the, there were many more correct answers than, uh, you know, than I, than I expected, you know, uh, <laughs> You know, so, you know, I wasn't sure. It didn't appear to me, at least, uh, unmasked Super Pro, for sure. I'm not sure he was fit, ready to finish it. But I definitely think the wrestling pro didn't didn't want to continue with this guy. So this is a good time, Dave, uh, for me to announce the winner, I guess. of the. I remember at the last, and you remember the last uh, stud cast, uh, I said uh, I was going to have a little contest to see who could tell me the name 
of the Super Pro before he got unmasked and uh, made that announcement last week. And to be honest with you, man, there were a lot more people that knew the answer to this question than I expected. So the winner and the first to answer, uh, about 10 seconds basically after I put up the first post of uh, where, of everybody take your guess uh, who's going to be the guy. Within, <laughs> within 20 seconds, I got an answer, and I was like, son of a gun, I didn't expect that. <laughs> and uh, So the guy that answered it was a guy I, named Mike Inslee, and uh, congratulations, Mike, you were right. But uh, obviously, many people knew who he was after he loses this match because he's going to continue wrestling the territory mm-hmm. without the mask. All right, I really enjoyed this feud over who was the real pro. Of course, I knew who the real pro was. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes, uh, you know, and obviously, and, and I'm, I'm probably sure you do, man, because he was. So, you know, and obviously, uh, Randy Rhodes was the real wrestling pro. The, I mean, uh, the real uh, super pro. Super pro, right, right. It, <laughs> and, uh, he had been masquerading with that mask and trying to get that name. And, uh, you know, so everybody knew him. And uh, so when it was all over, Dave, uh, you know, the next match uh, um, on the cart, was uh, the Southeastern Championship match between Rob and I facing the champion Mongolians managed by Mephisto. Loser of the match had to leave the Southeast, and uh, Stomper's son was the guy that lost the match. And Robert and I became the Southeastern Gulf Coast Tag Champions uh, basically for the first time, and that's crazy. We'd been there almost two years, but he and I had never been there at the same time long enough to ever win the Tag Championship. So in the Southeastern Championship match, the last one between Joe LaDuke and the Mongolian Stomper, managed by Mephisto, the match began where it left off basically on TV four days earlier. I mean, it became a bloody brawl. Uh, one referee got hurt, uh, couldn't good, had to be carried to the dress room. The second one came into the ring, and they he ended up having to disqualify both guys in an effort to stop the fight. But it didn't stop the fight. And after the bell was rung, uh, many times the bell just kept ringing and ringing. These guys just kept fighting. They went out on the floor. They went. They fought all the way back to Stomper's dressing room. Wow. Okay. So that's a great night of wrestling. So how about the attendance for all three of those major cities? Well, you know, uh, 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 it was a great night, as you said, uh, and the attendances were really, really good for all three of the major cities. They, they were, in fact, they were just about the same as the week before. Every building was almost full, almost totally full. Uh, Mobile was, and Mobile was a turn away again. Montgomery had 4,700 rather than 4,900 the week before, which is 200 less. Dothan had just about exactly the same size crowd, 5,200 people. And Mobile sold out again in Expo Hall. It had 5,600 in the building, and a lot of them couldn't get in. Don't know how many didn't get in. But uh, all three of those major cities averaged over 5,000 each. Wow. So I believe that that's pretty amazing right there. And here's some good news. I believe we are going to have enough time for a learning tree question. All right. So this one comes from Canada. And I hope I say his name right. Phil Lanneau. It may be Phil Lanot. I think it's Phil Lano from the Maritime Provinces asks, with your close relationship with Canadian wrestlers, such as Archie Goldie, Joe LeDuc, Ronnie Garvin, did you ever get asked to come north of the border into Canada for a short stint or just a match or two? Wow. That's a great question. Uh, you know, being a Canadian up there, uh, uh, I can I can understand you asking that. So, uh, and actually, uh, Mr. Lanot or Lanot, uh, Lanot maybe I guess it is. Uh, you know, uh, it, I, I did get asked, but it wasn't by any of those three Canadians that you mentioned. Uh, over the years, you know, my being part of the National Wrestling Alliance as a territory owner in the National Wrestling Alliance, I developed a close relationship with uh, Stu Hart who was the owner of the Calgary, Canada wrestling territory. And like my grandfather, Roy, Stu was also founder of one of the greatest and most famous wrestling families in history, the Hart family. 
and they had some great, great sons that uh, were in it. And a lot of relations, big, huge wrestling family. Uh, and Stu never failed to invite me every year to come to Calgary when, you know, uh, when we were in this NWA meetings, you know, uh, he always wanted me to come to Calgary, uh, to the Calgary Stampede Rodeo, which is a huge event up there in the summertime in uh, Calgary, Canada. And uh, they always had wrestling matches in conjunction with the rodeo. So every August when the NWA Promoters Convention was held, Stu would look me up. And, uh, you know, we had another tie-in, Stu and I, though, that went far beyond those meetings. And uh, not because we were best of friends did he come and uh, talk to me or look me up, but because he really missed one guy in particular. And that guy was Archie Goldie, the Mongolian stomper, who uh, was my top heel and uh, probably the greatest talent that Stu Hart ever trained. Mm. So uh, Phil... Uh, and I think that's what your name was. Uh, uh, but, I, but I can't resist telling at least one Stu story, man. You know, uh, Stu, Stu was one of the most unforgettable real-life characters uh, of the sport, period. I don't care what part of the country or part of the world it was. And Stu, uh, you know, uh, he, had a, he had a strange way of talking. <laughs> he, was, he was always, to me... Uh, I enjoyed being around him. He, he had in his home in, uh, he lived in Calgary again and on top of a hill, he had a huge home according to, uh, G Terry uh, Funk and uh, junior. Uh, they, they spent a lot of time up there. They went to every Calgary. They didn't miss a Calgary. And, uh, so, you know, in his home, he had what was called a dungeon down in his basement of his home. And, uh, and it was, he had a wrestling ring in it. And, and I got a feeling it was probably called a dungeon because it was uh, of all the pain that went on down there. He trained guys, and he was it was very cruel, man. So, uh, uh, And there was a small room, and Archie Goldie told me this story because Stu had trained him. He said, uh, Ron, uh, he said, Archie had this ring, and he said it was a very small basement, and he said it, did, it barely fit in the room. And he said one of the walls of the ring was right up against the wall of, uh, of his house. And he said, uh, he had, he said, Ron, he had taken nails and nailed these little nails into the wall of this house. And he said, he didn't nail the nails all the way into the wall. He left them sticking out about a half an inch. Mm -hmm. Right. And, uh, and he said, uh, he knew where the nails were. <laughs> So, you know, what was going on is uh, Stu and Stu got like, God, the uh, he's around the, he's Archie, Archie, Archie was a good guy, you know. And so he had this strange way of talking. And so uh, Archie said that uh, the first <laughs> few workouts they had, they were shooting. And, uh, and you know, uh, Stu wanted to find out how tough he was and whether he was going to make a wrestler or not. And, uh, you know, so Archie said that, uh, you know, he said, uh, I was doing pretty good against Stu. And he said, he jerked me up, Ron, and he drove me into the wall. And he said, he said, one of those nails went in my back. <laughs> right? And he said, uh, he said, he said, Stu. And then, and then he said, the, the heart, he said, oh, wait, wait, wow. And uh, he said, I got that guy. What happened? Uh, look, uh, you're bleeding. Jeez, uh, uh, what's that? I wonder how that happened. You know, and, uh, and he said they got started again, and Stu snatched him up again and ran him in. When Archie got to where he was getting Stu about to get take Stu down, Stu drove him in on another nail. He said, he said I figured out, Ron, right away. He knows where the nails are. <laughs> right? So uh, it was uh, evidently. Pretty tough training that mm. uh, that he went through with uh, with Stu Hart and uh, so what a character he was. So wow. uh, so I guess as Mr. Lineout, uh, you know, uh, thanks for your answer, sir. You know, and uh, and uh, and I was invited. So I gotta admit, I was invited to come and wrestle in Canada, man. And uh, and you know, I, I think I'm gonna always regret <laughs> that I never made that trip up there. You know, I don't believe I wanted to go down in the dungeon probably with Stu. Yeah. <laughs> but I would have sure liked to have been there. 
Yeah, I think your daddy would have would have appreciated you more if you had been through the dungeon for a few weeks. Hey, yeah, that he would have. That dad would have liked it. I don't know if I ever told that story. To yeah, I don't know if he uh, he probably would have tried to help you get signed up for that stud. Listen, that's why I love these stud casts. You know, you, you never know <laughs> what you're going to hear. You have lived a remarkable life, Ron. No doubt about it. This has been another great one, a really great one. So where are we riding next week, Stud? Well, next week's Hidden History Lesson is uh, going to be uh, it's going to be a multi-show subject. I mean, I've always wanted to explain uh, what I think is one of the greatest mistakes wrestling promoters and uh, ever made in the sport was the creation of these boxing and wrestling commissions all around the country. And uh, so uh, from my grandfather to Vince McMahon Jr. in the WWE, this story about wrestling commissions is going to take quite a few episodes to really to really tell everybody what this is all about. So, uh, it's a, it, it could be, it's going to become a truly legendary story here, I think. Uh, and part one of that we're going to get to in the next studcast. And then we're going to have another great card. It was also coming again on the next studcast. Uh, there's going to be three title matches on the card next time, and it's going to, one of them is going to, uh, again, be a loser leave. And in addition, there's going to be some new faces on the horizon that's going to change everything for the better. And hopefully, Dave, we'll have time for another Learning Tree question again next week. It absolutely sounds like a lot more one-of-a-kind wrestling history and i can't wait for that hey folks you know the, the, the deal you can find ron on facebook at ron fuller the tennessee stud like and follow him there automatically become friends with a living legend the exact same thing on twitter now known as x you find him at ron fuller welch on twitter follow him there too check out the fantastic website tnstud.com tnstud.com this stud cast is going to be there with every stud cast ever done Shop the stud store where you're going to get 43 super stud cast, four different eight by 10 photos and the thrilling lion novel Brutus, even personally autographed to you. Plus t-shirts still on sale, $15.99. What's the sweetest deal about that? Free shipping. It don't matter where you are. Subscribe now at YouTube Southeastern Rewind. Get the best in old school wrestling. Find 384 videos, the last 110 stud cast, 52 stud stories, 95 short rides with the stud, and 12 Ask the Stud question and answer shows, plus the new 13th on Saturday, January 20th. That is this Saturday of 2024, all exclusively on YouTube Southeastern Rewind, the best in old school wrestling. Go to YouTube in the search bar, put in Southeastern Rewind. Boom, it's the first one that pops up. All right, any final comments today, Stud? Yeah, I want to thank those fans that participate and send in questions to ask the Stud shows and the learning tree questions and things like that. Uh, obviously, I appreciate every every fan uh, for their support. And uh, please take care of yourselves and others. And may God bless us all. For Ron Fuller in the Great Smoky Mountains of Tennessee, I'm David Summers saying thank you for listening. Find me at David Summers Productions at gmail.com. This studcast is a David Summers production for Tennessee Stud LLC. Thanks for joining us today for this historic studcast. The true story continues next week. So full Nelson, your friends, and point them in our direction for another ride with the Tennessee Stud. This is David Summers saying so long from the Great Smoky Mountains.